Welcome to Fall Rise Give, a space where we invite you to dig into the real cause of your suffering. Looking at opportunities for growth with a change in your beliefs, thoughts, and actions so you can be your true self and be inspired. Join us as we explore life's ups and downs and navigate the twists and turns, sharing stories of resilience, hope, and the transformative power of giving back. Whether you're looking for a change, in recovery, or simply seeking inspiration, this podcast is your go-to for candid conversations, raw emotions, and a whole lot of heart. Tune in and discover how to fall, rise, and give back on life's extraordinary journey. Fall, rise, give, turning struggles into opportunities by being your true self and help others. How you doing? I'm Bartender Bob. That's Kumar, and we've got a special guest this week, Rachel. Kumar, I don't know if you knew this or not, but... Um, as you know, I'm a, a bartender in a small town, and Rachel is somebody that I know through my job. I'm just going to leave it right there and then let you get in and ask Rachel some questions. Uh, sounds good. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Rachel? Oh, my name is Rachel. I actually just moved to this little small town about a year and a half ago. I've spent the majority of my life in Denver in a much bigger city, so it's been quite a change. Um, I've been in and out of recovery since uh, 2017. When I went to my first treatment center, um, and it's kind of been a wild ride ever since. How did you benefit from recovery, and uh, you know a little bit more about what you're getting out of it, and why you continue to you know stay sober or stay dry, whatever you want to call it? You know, it's interesting because I was thinking about this, and it's it's honestly because I'm on I'm in the thick of it right now, right? I've had a, a, quite a few relapses and I'm I'm officially back to just hit over the 6 month mark, so I I'm, I'm really in the thick of negativity right now. So I like to consider recovery or being an addict or an alcoholic a death sentence. So I'm allowed to say that because I'm struggling. But um you know, it's it's always interesting to, when people ask me like how did you get sober or why did you get sober and it's like then you got to think about like the origins of like, why am I an addict? And, you know, is it, is it my genes? Is it how I grew up? Like, where did it all stem from? And, and, you know, my story started with like the death of my brother and, and facing that reality of life versus death. And I just kind of went, went down the path of just living life to the fullest, which has really spun me into a world of addiction of drinking and drugs and partying and, you know, many, many years later, you know, it was like seven years into it. I thought I had not gone a single day without a drink. And I, I got to the point where I, I physically couldn't stop. And it was the first reality is that like, oh my gosh, I have a problem. What am I going to do? And, you know, I know, I knew I had a problem and I was actually in church one day and I, I was sick, you know, in and out of hospitals. I mean, you know, I, I have reached out and I went to my first treatment center in 2017 in Arizona and I was really dedicated to it. Never, I didn't know anything about AA at the time of recovery process, none of that, but I did commit to a 90 day inpatient. And then even after that, I thought I'm not quite ready to face the world yet with this newfound understanding that I'm an addict. And I did another 30 days of um, outpatient there, you know, you stay in a sober living facility and then went back to Colorado and I, I, you know, there's a thing in recovery, you do 90 meetings in, in 90 days. And when you're in treatment, you don't really have a choice not to do that. So I, I mean, I, I completed that. But the community of recovery in Phoenix was so huge. I mean, you couldn't go to you go to a meeting, sometimes there'd be 100 people in there. And I really grew deep friendships with these people. And I when I went back to Colorado, I, I stayed in it. And I not only stayed in the AA, I joined CA, which if you're not familiar, is, is Cocaine Anonymous. And, you know, there's just a little bit more lax rules or you're talking more about overall drug use, not just having to stay specific to some of the old traditions of AA where they're very specific about just saying the alcoholic. So I felt more comfortable there and I started going to conventions all across the country. And um, we helped a sober friend from lived in Long Island, who's getting off drugs, drove them all the way back down to Arizona, all the way up the coast of California. And we went to meetings in every state we stopped all the way across the country. And we finished at the, the World Convention for Cocaine Anonymous. They do once a year. And it's a tremendously huge event with speakers and everybody, just a hotel full of sober people. 
And I, I really stuck with it. And I achieved about three and a half years of sobriety. And I was doing really well. I mean, working the steps is not easy. And, you know, there's these sayings like, you know, don't leave before the miracle happens in yeah. recovery. And yeah. that and and like these these spiritual epiphanies and and this is enlightenment that I was living in. And it's it's hit 2020. And I don't know why I did it. I told my cousin, I thinking about drinking again that I, I drank it and, and it just now I'm sitting in a space where it's like, where's, where's the goddamn miracle? It's not happening. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm white knuckling it as they say right now, because I'm not being involved in the program of recovery right now. And partly to do because I am in a much smaller community and, you know, it's, it's just crazy how fast you can forget all the things that you learn in recovery when you go back into active addiction. Um, you know, it's just, it's, that tells you a little bit about it. But in that time period, though, when I relapsed, it was about three months before I was snorting an eight ball a week and drinking a bottle of vodka a day. Back to wow. detox, inpatient, um, got out of inpatient, got so sick, throwing up blood every day again, too much alcohol. I uh, went to treatment in Utah after that. Utah was different, though. Uh, Utah, they're trying to modernize recovery these days, you know, smart recovery, different types of ways to, I believe, for companies to make money off of recovery. Oh. And I went into a inpatient that was a completely non-AA related program. So they yeah. did not do any kind of AACA meetings, nothing. And I did 30 days. The day I got to the airport to go back home, I went straight to the bar and got a glass of wine. So uh, it didn't work for me. And then just on a trail of destruction after that, came to Wisconsin, found a boyfriend who likes to drink just as much as I do, partied my ass off, ended up back in the hospital with acute liver failure, um, got real, real sick, throwing up blood every day got a little suicidal, thought I'd stab myself and uh, thought I'd stab the floor first. And it turns out I have stop at wood and uh, slip my hand wide open and uh, ended up in an ambulance in the emergency room and just realized I, I the insanity of this disease has once again consumed every single thing in my life. And uh, it's hard to not look at it like a death sentence. Um, but the reality is, once you come out of the darkness, you remember that there's a program of recovery that is based on a book written in the 1930s. And if you've ever read that book, it's yeah. like you're sitting back in time. Like it's it's this overwhelming system built on, you know, one of the 12 traditions that, you know, you do this with no monetary, no help for money. We are self-supporting financially. It's It's based on people giving their time free people, you know, everything about the beautiful nature of recovery is just, it's, it's mind blowing to think that it truly exists and that it truly works. It's just getting yourself to wanting to do the work again is the hard part that I struggle with. Yeah. But it sounds like, you know, a lot about the program and the benefits of it. It's just a matter of figuring out, you know, how to tap into that energy again. And I call it energy. I think it's obviously a program and it's spiritual based and all of that. Um, but I think there is this amazing energy that comes out of people being vulnerable, going to meetings, this authenticness. People genuinely care about each other and wanting to help each other. Like you said, it's a, it's a huge community. And so it sounds like you're kind of aching for that a little bit, maybe thinking about um, seeing what you're missing. Is that is that an accurate statement? Yeah, I think so. I think that just because I came so close to death this time that I'm just really treading lightly on like what I know I'm signing up for in recovery again. But it's just the it's just the knowing that it's there. You know, it's just the knowing that there's a solution and that all I got to do is just make that step that one day. So yeah, I was I would guess like you could say I'm, I'm a little bit yearning for it. You know, Rachel, the, the the reason I know you is because I'm a bartender in the same small town that we, that you live in and I don't know if people noticed while we were talk while you were talking, a train went by. We live about a quarter mile away from each other and you could hear that you I could hear at least with my mm -hmm. headphones on 
I could hear the uh, the whistle of the train. I don't know if you could have heard that Kumar or not, but so I mean, Rachel and I are close in proximity now. But you you are a, you were a patron at the bar where I yeah, work. Yeah, I was a drunk, and I remember you telling me that you that you were in re, that you have been in recovery and you're off the way again. And I and as a bartender, that hurt me. I mean, that was that was hard to deal with, and I it and it was harder for me to hand you a, a beer at that time. You know what I mean? And, and, and I was, as a man, I was torn because I didn't know if I should back you up and just say, you know what? No, you don't need to drink. But as the, you know, with my boss sitting right there watching, you know what I mean? So I don't know what I'm trying to say here, but living in a small town, because there's 191 people here, people know who you are. Is it, is it hard to stop, you know, stop doing what you did do? I mean, is it is it hard because you're 192 days in right now? Is that been difficult for you? It definitely is, and I gotta say, from your perspective, there's this saying that said, "Don't co-sign other people's bullshit." You know, in recovery, like you can't take responsibility for serving me a drink because I'm choosing to go down that path again. And I, I forget what I talked about, like in the big book too, where it's like it's even hard being in a relationship. I'm in a relationship with somebody who's actively drinking. You know, but you have to learn to, that my problem is not other people's problem. You know, how how can I not impact them? Like they, they can't not drink because I can't drink. That's not fair. That's not right. So you have to force yourself to become comfortable in the environment of still going to the bar, being able to drink a non-alcoholic beer, because that's my responsibility, you know, to not make other people have to change because of my illness, if that makes sense. One thing, I, one thing I've noticed, though, with you and your partner is that you both are drinking NAs when you come in now, you know, so it, 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 at least that's what I've noticed when I'm there. That's since changed. It's oh. actually I- ironic. I saw him drunk for the first time two weeks ago, and man, did that have an impact on me. It was um, a, negative, it, a negative impact? Tremendously, but I hate to say that, but... Again, where's where do you draw the line? Somebody that doesn't have a problem can drink. I, you know, how far around down the road do you want to seclude yourself from everybody else in the world? We live in a world where drinking is part of everywhere we go, everything we do. If you can't be around somebody who's drinking, how can you go anywhere? Yeah, no, I agree. My wife likes to drink as well. And so she'll have a couple of glasses of wine at home. Or we'll go to the local pub and we'll I'll grab NAs and she'll drink. But and I work from home, so I need to get out of the house. Mm-hmm. So for me, I'll do my dog walk and stuff. But I want to socialize with my older friends that I've known for a long time. And so I'll go watch a game there or go hang out. And uh, I, I'm not expecting anybody else not to drink. I'm just taking responsibility for myself. It sounds like you've done a, a lot of work in the program, and you really are talking about deep things about individual responsibility individual accountability and all of those things that come out of it you really should give yourself a lot more credit for that i think that's really a mature you know wise way of thinking um that's evolved i think you should give yourself some credit for that i think that's pretty amazing that you have that mindset because you're right only person you can control is you and your thoughts and your responsibility and your behavior you can't change or be responsible for anybody else's behavior. Yeah. You know, throughout the process of being, you know, everything always comes into question whether or not you, you're you spiritual or you have a belief system. And, and that's what deters a lot of people from the program, you know. how if, When you're in a meeting and there's a bunch of old timers there and somebody brings up the question about God, it's like they all hate it. They don't want to have that conversation again. But so I went on the journey and I did like me- Buddhist meditation retreats. You know, I did... Um, a program called Sai, and I did it. It's where you have a life coach program for 90 days and you do a bunch of different, you know, I, I dug as far as I could into all of this. And just like one common thing that I found through all, anything that I tried to attempt in sobriety was like, everything comes down to community. It's a 100% fact. If you're not of service to your community, you know, I mean, it's, it's the same with the 12th step. Like the 12th step is once you've achieved this sobriety, you have to pass it along to the person that's you know, sick and still suffering. And it's, it's, I think where I'm struggling at right now is like, it's not just the community that I live in. It's like the community of like my friends, my family, you know, because 
you're living in this space where like you literally feel like every day is like I'm going to live or die because at this point in in my I, if I drink again, I'm not going to make it. They say we end up three places, jails, institutions, and death. I've been in jail. I've been to plenty of institutions. Like all that's left for me is death. So I live on this very fragile frame right now where it's like sobriety is everything to me. And when you're in a community of people where they don't have to live with that type of heavy weight on every single day, every single decision, like him getting too drunk around me one time doesn't seem like a big deal to him. But to me, you know, it's my entire life could be over with just that one drink. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. And I think it's a heavy burden, like you said. And so I think you need to, I don't want to say you need to, um, I think the way you're thinking about it is, is, is a good way. Um, and so taking care of your personal needs and how you spend your time and tapping into that community or that resource, I think is really critical. Um, I'm not a hard alcoholic. Um, I, uh, never really drank during the day except for the weekend games or anything like that. Uh, for me, I did have a hard time putting together days without alcohol, without glass of wine. But I was always very functional. I was got up in the morning. I never really had health problems, except for I gained a lot of weight. Um, so for me, I still, even though I'm not a hard alcoholic, I still benefit from that community and tapping into it and getting mm -hmm. the strength, getting the support, getting, it's like group therapy in a way. And it's, yeah. and it's spiritual in so many ways. There's so many deep insights and in attitude adjustment program, as I call AA, you really learn to think differently. And um, for me, the biggest benefit has really been around what I call God, what they call God shots, what I call God juice. I go to meetings and I come out of there more spiritual and more into trusting my higher power, whatever that is. Uh, for example, I haven't been to the meetings the last couple of days just because of events that are going on in my life. And I feel a little bit lost today. Um, I felt a little anxious for whatever reason. And that's just two days not going to a meeting. And so um, there's definitely some sort of a spiritual energy connection that you get. Um, I have a friend who um, is pretty high up in cybersecurity at a company. And uh, she mentioned to me that um, there's a level of consciousness that people have and uh, an average alcoholic not in treatment has a consciousness level of 90, whereas an average person has like 150, 160. And they do consciousness level, they have a formula for it, and they, consciousness is like a level of spirituality or authenticness. And um, an AA meeting has a consciousness level of 450. Wow. It's, it's pretty crazy. So once I heard that and the way I – come out of it. Every meeting that I go to, I get something out of it. And so um, that's why I'm in the program. That's why my 12th step is part of doing the podcast, trying to share this, you know, positive thought process, things that people get out of recovery. I think people in out of recovery are, are tapping into a higher power or higher energy source that really makes a difference in people's lives. And I think sharing more of that is kind of the purpose of this podcast and helping people. Uh, you don't have to be an alcoholic, but I think a grateful alcoholic has a lot to offer to the world. And I think you have that in your way because you were given this choice. And I think you have a great story set because you do have a mind powerful thinking process. Like you said, I mean, the, it's such a profound thing that you're mentioning about self responsibility and accountability um, and not being in control of somebody else's feeling. Yeah. So anyway, that's just what I had to say at the moment. The, well, the thing about recovery in like working a program is not only in the program of recovery, are you getting together like as a community and support? I mean, really you could be on like oh, your worst day and you go in there and somebody speaks because they're struggling so bad and you're just like, oh my gosh, you immediately take, you like your pain is taken away and you're feeling for somebody else. You know, like where I thought I was just going to have a drink 10 minutes ago. Now I just really badly don't want this person to drink today. Like that's the miracle of it. 
working the steps, the miracle of the steps is just true personal building morals that you're going to start standing by, values, holding yourself accountable. I mean, it's amazing how just simply not lying and letting it get away, like holding yourself, you change the way you speak because you know that if you say a lie, you're going to have to make an amends. You're going to have to tell that person that you lied to them. So you stop it because it's such a pain in the ass to make an amends. So it's just crazy how it just changes your behavior. And, you know, there was this one time I did this program, one of the programs I did, they did this energy therapy it was this, this old couple and they were retired doctors. And, you know, the principle that energy is never created nor destroyed, right? So these memories that we have, like like when my brother died or whatever trauma, like however you tell your story of trauma in your life, you remember where you were standing. You remember what you were wearing. You know, you remember exactly these things. That takes so much of your energy to keep those specifics alive. And so it's kind of like the same, the same thing. Once you're, you, and every time we lie to somebody or we do something disgusting or we do something we're not proud of or we do whatever, we're keeping this, all this energy. But when you stop doing those things, it is like living in freedom. Like recovery has so many different, the program has so many different benefits just to your own personal life, not just like your community life, but just being a better person. Cause just some of us, especially us addicts, we were not born good people, you know, like we do need a program to, to teach us how to be I good. That. Rachel, I don't know if I believe that you're said you're not born good people. I mean, I've known you for just I'm a couple not. of years and, and I've known you as, as I've known you as a drinker, a drunk, and now as a sober person. And I believe that in all three of those situations, all three of those people that I knew, you could tell that you were a good person. I mean, I could tell that from the first time that I met you, even though you were drinking and even though you were drunk. But as a sober person, I can see that even more of the, more of the butterfly is there, Rachel, that you're there, <laughs> that, you know, that, that you truly are a good person and you truly are a person that, that cares about other people. You care about yourself. You care about, you know, you care about your partner. You care. You, to me, it seems like you, like you want to be there. You want to, you know, you want to be a part of it and you want to help people out. So I don't, I don't buy the we're born as bad people thing. I, I think that maybe we make bad choices. We make shitty choices in our lives. Yeah. And eventually, sometimes they catch up to you. But I think a lot of times people have, as you guys say, the amends or whatever that, you know, it's like, hey, you know what? I screwed up. I, I, I'm eating a shit sandwich today and I'm going to be okay tomorrow and let's just move on with life and let's make it, you know, the best that it can be. Yeah. You know, and, and like I got, like I said, back to like white knuckling it, like getting six months sober without a program right now is just, the, I'm just torturing myself. I really, truly am. But I didn't have a choice, you know, but it's the same time. It's, it's every single day is hard still every single day. Um, it's, you mentioned zoom meetings and you've been to a bunch of them and then you said you don't have a choice. Um, I know <laughs> that's the only thing I want to hold <laughs> you accountable for. Funny how that happens. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. There's zoom I meetings know. everywhere. I, um, I choose to go to zoom meetings because I think it's too much of a hassle for me to get ready, drive somewhere, be in a room and then wait and talk to people after, you know, I just think it's a whole ordeal, hour and a half, two hours. Whereas if I just go to a Zoom meeting, I may go there five minutes early, have a small conversation. I may stay five minutes later, but it's so efficient for me. And once you are in a part of a community, you really appreciate that community. It doesn't matter where you're at. I mean, we're getting to know each other through a version of Zoom right now, right? We're able to see each other squares in the box and able to talk about energy. And somehow the topic got to amends and uh, being authentic. And I think true healing, like you said, starts with us being honest with ourselves and then admitting our faults to others. Um, obviously that's step four and five and step nine, but without going through the steps, I think there's a healing process for all of us. And part of that healing process is being honest with ourselves and then apologizing to others for the wrongs that you've caused. Um, I had a situation yesterday where I was, I've been with my son for the last few days. Uh, my wife is out of town and um, I want to take this opportunity to spend time with him and then make amends for some of the things that I had done, you know, being rude or drunk or whatever. 
And so I was able to spend some time with them and really make those amends. So start the healing process between the both of us. Now we get along pretty well most most of the time, but just going a little bit deeper into a layer of making amends for the past, I think that brings us closer and heals the relationship even further. So anyway, I can't speak more than more than that about healing process and how healing, I think, starts with authenticness, like you said, not lying to others. But once you do come out of it, once you're in a comfortable space, making amends with other people. And healing usually, I think, has to do with your own self, but your our energy is tied to somebody else with their with their energy and things that you were talking about. Go ahead. Can, I just, inter- can I just interject here a second? Because yeah. I've since I'm I'm not an alcoholic, but I have had a, a a healing choice. I got laid off from a job back in 2008, and I held the grudge for the guy that laid me off for ten years. I mean, I was just pissed off. I hated the guy. I thought he was a complete and total a hole. And I was at a concert maybe. 10 years ago, maybe eight years, whatever. I was at a concert a while back and I ran into him and instead of being angry at him, instead of, you know, just getting up there and getting in there and getting in his face or whatever, I I went up to him and I said, you know what, Brian, I forgive you. (laughs) And he looked at me like, you forgive me? What What are you talking about? And I just said, you know what? I forgive you and I forgive myself for thinking about that he was the reason that I got fired, that he caused my whole thing. And I did, and, and as soon as I did that, I felt like this whole big, like the whole world was just taken off my shoulders and my whole life kind of turned at that moment. And I felt like, you know what? Life is not as shitty as I thought it was, you know, what I, what I thought it was just because of the fact that I, I gave up that feeling of resentment and anger toward that guy. And that that's my healing story, you know? And, and, and since then I've, I've, given that up every time. I mean, there's, there's people that you and I know, Rachel in town that I not a fan of, but I tell myself, you know what? I forgive them. They are who they are. They can just go on and be who they are, you know? Yeah. And then that's, that's why the, the, you know, making your amends is so hard. Like when you're writing your, you know, your four step, you know, you're supposed to write down when you're, you're taking your entire life inventory, right? Like everybody that you've ever harmed, everybody that's ever harmed you. I mean, this thing takes days to write in pages and pages and pages to dissect every little thing that you've held on to for all these years. And then you are trying to make amends to everyone that you can and knock them off the list. And there was like this just unbelievable experience of like getting that out of your entire being. Like I can no longer carry all this. And if that's, if that's some of the market that I wasn't forgiven by a lot of people, they, they listened to me and they let me make my amends, but I still don't have a relationship with them to this day. Cause I did some horrible things to a lot of people, you know, the damage I'd done, but that's okay. You know, like I didn't have to care about it anymore, you know, and it, it really is. It, it's just an amazing experience, but it's just so hard, <laughs> so hard to go through. You know, I mean, you're talking about, I'm talking like massive amounts of damage that I've done with my drinking and drug use and the people that I've hurt, bridges I've burned. But again, yeah, the same healing, like, you know, letting it go or not holding on to it anymore because everybody's capable of their own limitations, you know? So, you know, harping on somebody that, just has, you know, they, they just, they're just different people. You have to accept everybody for who they are. I, I think that was a huge part for me was like, I kept having these expectations, expectations and like expectations are premeditated resentments, you know, that's all they are. And learning to reframe my mind in that, you know, you know, I feel like you guys are trying to get me to go to a meeting right now or something. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I think, I mean, you know, deep in your heart, what you need or what you want. Um, I know. And you know, we would, it's all about attraction rather than, you know, promotion. It's just- um, but I think you're pretty wise. And I think you have a lot of deep insights into the healing part of it. Um, yeah, making amends um, is hard. But I think we don't have to do it in person. We can do it in our mind or through prayer, or through forgiveness. Um, I tend to do that. Um, during my prayers um, and we've talked about the chakra system, the Hindu chakra system, it aligns pretty well with the principles. And I think your heart um, really heals when you have forgiveness, when you forgive other people and, and you forgive yourself, your heart opens up a little bit. 
And that's where compassion comes in, self-compassion along with compassion for other people. And like the Buddhist thing, when you start caring about other people, um, your needs start to be met. And so, yeah, I think at least making amends in your own prayer or in your thought process or meditation helps a lot. You don't have to necessarily make amends in person. When, when the opportunity is right, it's important to do that, but I don't think it's necessary from a spiritual standpoint and from a whole being standpoint that we have to go down this laundry list and and um, try to make amends with people at a physical level. I think it's important at, this, at the very start to be able to, in prayer or in thinking and in self-reflection, to be able to apologize and do the best that you can. I think that, I think, in, and in, it just comes to mind that, like, it, there's a huge, it, like, when I got sober, there was no Zoom meetings, you know, there was none of that. That all came about after COVID, you know, so if you went to a meeting, you know, there were rules against you couldn't even use your phone in a meeting, let alone have a camera set up to be able to record, you know, so you had to go. You had to go in front of people. You had to make your amends in, pe- in front of people. You know, the, my sponsors were so mean. It, I mean, you know, it was it was a tough program. It was no bullshit, you know, like, and it, it, it just seems to have evolved a little bit with like the, you know, the way things have kind of changed and being able to do Zoom meetings and stuff now. So, I mean, I, got, I haven't worked an active program now for long enough to, un- to you know, to to be able to say like, can I make my amends that way? Or do I really have to sit down with my father and apologize for the hundreds of thousands of dollars he had to spend on me again to go to treatment just so I could turn around and snort my face off and drink some more and end up in the hospital. You know, I mean, like, it's hard. It's hard. It's just a hard situation. Recovery. The, and- but I think you'd agree, you'd agree that, and I agree, it's worth it on what you get out of the program. And I 100%. think only knowing you for half an hour, I think you're an amazing person, spiritual and um, deep understanding of who you are. Um, and I think we need to be not so hard on ourselves, not to spend too much energy in our bad days, but also give ourselves credit for the good days that we have. And I think you uh, have spent enough time and energy into this recovery thing to know that you're a, a good person. You're out there. Um uh, I do have a hope that you don't white knuckle it anymore and do your thing, whatever you want to do to get, to get part of a community. Uh, But it's been a pleasure to get to know you and um, thank you for sharing your insights. I think responsibility, accountability and making amends, even though it's very hard, like you said, it does go a long ways towards self healing and healing in the community that we have. So I appreciate you being here today. I appreciate you listening to my life. (laughs) Thank you for joining us on this episode of Fall Rise Give, where we explore stories of resilience, growth, and giving back. If you enjoyed today's episode, please visit our website at www.fallrisegive.com. Also consider subscribing to our podcast on your favorite platform and leaving us a review. Your feedback helps us to continue to bring you inspiring stories. Stay tuned for our next episode, and remember, every fall is a chance to rise, and every rise is an opportunity to give. Until next time, keep falling, rising, and giving. This is Fall Rise Give, produced by podcastforhire.com. Thank you for listening.